The Sign of the Beaver by Elizabeth George Spear A Dell Yearling Book A Newberry Honor Book Reading Level 5.7 Chapter 5 Day after day he kept remembering the bee tree. He and his father had discovered it weeks ago. High in a tree at the swampy edge of the pond they had called Loon Pond, the bees were buzzing in and out of an old woodpecker hole. Matt had thought they were wild bees, but his father said no, there were no bees at all in America till the colonists brought them from England. This swarm must have escaped from one of the river towns. Bees were better left alone, Pa said. He felt he could scarcely endure another meal of plain fish. He was hungry for a bit of something tasty. Knowing so well his fondness for molasses, his mother had persuaded them to carry that little keg all the way to Maine, when his father would have rather gone without. She would have smiled to see him running his finger round and round the empty keg like a child and licking off the last drop the bear had missed. Now he couldn't stop thinking about that honey. It'd be worth a sting or two just to have a taste of it. There couldn't be much danger in going up that tree and taking just a little, a cupful perhaps, that the bees would never miss. One morning he made up his mind to try it, come what may. It was an easy tree to climb with branches as neatly placed as the rungs of a ladder. The bees did not seem to notice as he pulled himself higher and higher. Even when his head was on a level with the hole, they flew lazily in and out, not paying him any mind. The hole was small, not big enough for his hand and the spoon he had brought with him. Peering in, he could just glimpse far inside the golden mass of honeycomb. The bark all around the hole was rotted and crumbling. Cautiously, he put his two fingers on the edge and gave a slight tug. A good-sized piece of bark broke off in his hand. With it came the bees. With a furious buzzing, they came pouring from the broken hole. The humming grew to a roar like a great wind. Matt felt a sharp pain on his neck, then another and another. The angry creature swarmed along his hands and bare arms and his hair on his face. How he got down out of that tree, he never remembered. Water. If he could reach water, he could escape below. Bellowing and waving his arms, he plunged toward the pond. The bees were all around him. He could not see through the whirling cloud of them. The boggy ground sucked at his feet. He pulled one foot clear out of his boot, went stumbling over sharp roots to the water's edge, and flung himself forward. His foot caught in a fallen branch, and he wrenched it clear. Dazed with pain, he sank down into the icy shelter of the water. He came up choking. Just above the water, the angry bees circled. Twice more he ducked his head and held it down till his lungs were bursting. He tried to swim out into the pond, but his feet were tangled in dragging weeds. When he tried to jerk them free, a fierce pain ran up his leg and he went under again, thrashing his arms wildly. Then something lifted him. His head came up from the water and he gulped air into his aching lungs. He felt strong arms around him. Half conscious, he dreamed that his father was carrying him and he did not wonder how this could be. Presently he knew he was lying on dry ground. Though his eyelids were swollen almost shut, he could see two figures bending over him, unreal, half-naked figures with dark faces. Then, as his wits began to return to him, he saw that they were Indians, an old man and a boy. The man's hands were reaching for his throat, and in panic, Matt tried to jerk away. Not move, a deep voice ordered. Bee needles have poison. Must get out. Matt was too weak to struggle. He could not even lift his head. Now that he was out of the cold water, his skin seemed to be on fire from head to toe, yet he could not stop shivering. He had to lie helpless while the man's hands moved over his face and neck and body. Gradually he realized that they were gentle hands, probing and rubbing at one tender spot after another. His panic began to die away. He could still not think clearly. Things seemed to keep fading before he could quite grasp them. He could not protest when the man lifted him again and carried him like a baby. It did not seem to matter where they were taking him, but shortly he found himself lying on his own bed in his own cabin. He was alone. The Indians had gone. He lay, too tired and sore to figure out how he came to be there, knowing only that the nightmare of whirling bees and choking water was past, and that he was safe. Some time passed, then once again the Indian was bending over him, holding a wooden spoon against his lips. He swallowed in spite of himself, even when he found it was not food but some bitter medicine. 
he was left alone again, and presently he slept. Chapter 6 Finally Matt woke and knew that he was well. His body was no longer on fire. He could open his eyes, and he saw that sunlight glinted through the chinks in the roof. All his familiar things were around him, the shelves with the pewter dishes, his jacket hanging on a peg. He felt as though he had been on a long journey and had come home. He must have slept through half a day and a night. When the cabin door opened and the Indian entered, Matt hastily pulled himself up. Now, with clear eyes, he saw that there was nothing in the least strange about this man. He was dressed not so differently from Matt's own father, in a coat of some rough brown cloth and leggings fringed down the side. His face was, his face was smooth-shaven, and so was his whole head except for one long black topknot. When he saw that Matt was awake, his stern face was lighted by a wide smile. Good. It was half word, half grunt. White boy very sick. Now well. Matt remembered his father's advice. Good morning, he said respectfully. The Indian pointed a hand at his own chest. Sockness, family of beaver, he said. He seemed to be waiting. I'm Matthew Hallowell, Matt answered. Good. White man leave you here? Just for a while, Matt told him. He, was, he is going to get my mother. It did not occur to him to lie to this old man as he had to Ben. Moreover, he knew that there was something he had to say. He tried to find the right words. I'm grateful to you, he said finally. It was a very lucky thing you happened to find me. We watch. Wade Bull very foolish to climb bee tree. So he'd been right, Matt thought, that eyes were watching him from the forest. He was sure that the Indian had not asked him where he lived. They had brought him straight home to this cabin. Even though he knew it was his good fortune they'd been watching him yesterday, he still felt somewhat resentful of their spying. Abruptly, he swung his feet to the floor and winced as a sharp pain ran up his leg. The Indian noticed, and moving closer, he took Matt's ankle between his hands and pressed gently with his fingers. Is it broken? Matt asked. Mada, not broke. Men soon. Sleep now. Not need medicine more. The Indian had put something on the table as he came in. When he had gone, Matt hobbled over to see what it was and found a wooden bowl of stew, thick and greasy, flavored with some strange plant, wonderfully filling and strengthening. With it there was a cake of cornbread, coarser than his own, but delicious. The next day the Indian brought the boy with him. Mikwenis, you call grandson, he announced. Etienne. The two boys stared at each other. The Indian boy's black eyes held no expression whatsoever. Unlike the old man, he was naked except for a breech cloth held up by a string at his waist. It passed between his legs and hung down like a little apron front and back. His heavy black hair fell straight to his shoulders. ATN same winter as white boy, maybe? The man asked. He held up ten fingers and then four more. I'm thirteen, Matt answered, holding up his own fingers. At least, he excused himself, that would be true in another week. The Indian boy did not speak a word. Quite plainly, he had been brought here against his will. He stared about the cabin and seemed to despise everything he saw. He made Matt feel like a fool sitting with his leg propped up on a stool. Matt steadied himself on his good leg and stood up. Now he noticed that Sockness was holding out to him a rough sort of crutch. Matt wished he did not have to try it right now with both of them watching him, but he could see that the man expected it. He managed a few steps, furious at his own clumsiness. He had never imagined how pesky a crutch could be. Moreover, although there was not the slightest change in the boy's face, Matt was sure that ATN was laughing at him. There was a nasty little gleam in the boy's eyes. The moment they were gone, he seized the crutch in earnest, and very soon he could swing himself along at a good brisk pace. Now he was able to get about outside the cabin to check the corn patch and bring in firewood. The trouble was, he had only one boot. The woolen stocking his mother had knit for him was wearing thin. On the rough ground it wore through in no time. This too the Indian noticed when he came with his grandson next morning. No boot, he said, pointing. I lost it, Matt answered. It came off in the mud when I ran. Once again he felt ridiculous under the Indian boy's black stare. Three days later, Sockness brought him a pair of moccasins. They were handsome and new, of moose hide, dark and glistening with grease, 
tied with stout thongs that were long enough to wrap about his ankles. Beaver women make, Softness said, better white man's boots. White boys see. Matt took off this one boot and slipped on the moccasins. Indeed, they were better. In fact, they were wonderful. Not stiff like new leather boots. Not knobby or pinching anywhere. Light as nothing at all when he lifted his feet. No wonder Indians did not make a sound when they walked in the forest. Shame suddenly flooded over Matt. This man had perhaps saved his life, had come bringing food and a crutch, and now these beautiful moccasins? It wasn't enough just to say an awkward thank you. He needed to give him something in return, not money. There were a few silver coins in the tin box, but something made him very sure that he could not offer money to this proud old man. He looked about him in despair. There was almost nothing of his own in the cabin. Then he spied the two books on the shelf, the only two his father had been able to carry into the wilderness. One was the Bible. He dared not give away his father's Bible. The other book was his own, the only one he had ever possessed, Robinson Crusoe. He had read it a dozen times, and the thought of parting with it was painful, but it was the only thing he had to give. He hobbled across the room and took it down from the shelf and held it out to the Indian. Sockness stared at it. It's for you, Matt said. It's a gift. Please take it. Sockness reached out and took the book in his hand. He turned it over and over slowly, his face showing not a sign of pleasure. Then he opened it and stood peering at the page. With shame, Matt saw that he was holding it upside down. He couldn't read. Of course he couldn't. Matt should have known that. He had made a terrible mistake. It embarrassed a good man. He had heard once that the one thing an Indian could never forgive was a hurt to his pride. He felt his own face burning. But Sockness did not look embarrassed. His dark stare went from the book to Matt's face. White boy no signs? he asked. Matt was puzzled. White boy read what white men write here? Yes, Matt admitted. I can read it. For a long moment, the Indian studied the book. Then, astonishingly, that rare white smile flashed. Good, he grunted. Sockness make treaty. A treaty? Matt was even more puzzled. McWinnis hunt. Bring white boy bird and rabbit. White boy teach Atian white man signs. You mean I should teach him to read? Good. White boy teach Atian what book say. Doubtfully, Matt looked from the old man to the boy who stood silently listening. His heart sank. The scorn in the boy's face had turned to black anger. Nada! The furious word exploded, the first word Matt had ever heard him speak. Half under his breath, he muttered a string of incomprehensible words. His grandfather's stern face did not change. He was undisturbed by the boy's defiance. Atian learn, he said. White men come more and more to Indian land. White men not make treaty with pipe. White men make signs on paper, signs Indians do not know. Indian put mark on paper to show him friend of white man. Then white man take land. Tell Indian cannot hunt on land. Atian learn to read white man's signs. Atian not give away hunting grounds. The boy glowered at his grandfather, but he did not dare to speak again. With a black scowl, he stalked out of the cabin. Good, said Sockness calmly. He handed the book back to Matt. Etienne come Seba tomorrow.